So welcome to this uh, session uh, of uh, how Expedia leverages uh, Amazon uh, DynamoDB and the DynamoDB Accelerator uh, technology that we released earlier this year. Um, so I'm Vijay Natarajan. I'm the principal product manager in the Amazon DynamoDB team. And um, this is Brandon. And uh, thanks, Brandon, for uh, coming over and uh, presenting uh, the uh, session as to how Expedia's experience has been. So I'll just uh, you know, set the stage in terms of, uh, for folks who are not familiar with DynamoDB and DAX, uh, give you a very quick brief overview, and I'll hand it over to uh, Brandon uh, to talk about how um, their real-time uh, travel analytics application uh, leverages uh, DynamoDB and uh, DAX and the business and the technology benefits uh, that uh, the team realized. So uh, how many of you are uh, familiar with uh, what DynamoDB is? Uh, show of hands. OK, about uh, half of you. Uh, how many of you have DynamoDB uh, in uh, production today? OK, about half of you. OK, uh, so uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, DynamoDB is a fully managed uh, NoSQL uh, cloud database service um, that is uh, essentially uh, promises uh, single-digit millisecond latency at any scale. By any scale, I mean whether it is you know, tables with few items in them or tables with hundreds of terabytes of data in them, right? So the scalability aspect is what uh, primarily differentiates uh, DynamoDB uh, with uh, other offerings out there. Uh, DynamoDB supports uh, two data models. Uh, it's a key value store as well as a, a document store in uh, JSON format. Uh, going back to the scalability aspect, um, all you need to do is uh, you just uh, come into the you know, AWS management console uh, or through the APIs. You create a DynamoDB table, and you turn on uh, this thing called auto-scaling that we released earlier this year, where you set the target utilization that you want for your table, and DynamoDB under the hood essentially monitors all the consumption throughput that is coming in from your application and scales up or down the provision capacity to ensure that you are getting the throughput that you need at the same time offering it in that single digit millisecond response times. So um, that speaks to the fully managed aspect of it um, further. And with DynamoDB, you are not um, you know, provisioning any hardware as with the you know, cloud value proposition. You're not thinking about software. You're not thinking about patching. You're not thinking about maintenance operations, none of that. All you do is just create a table, and you are good to go, right? Um, DynamoDB, as with any AWS service, is uh, also highly available, uh, where uh, we uh, maintain uh, three uh, copies in uh, different AZs in a region, so you do not have to uh, worry about uh, availability as well. So it is uh, designed for uh, supporting any business-critical application that you might have. Uh, switching over to uh, DynamoDB Accelerator, uh, essentially think of it as an in-memory caching layer on top of DynamoDB that is 100% compatible with DynamoDB. It has all the characteristics that we talked about in terms of scalability, where you can scale out as much as uh, 10 nodes in a DAX cluster. It, has, uh, um, it is um, fault tolerant uh, in, with inbuilt fault tolerance, uh, as well as um, it is 100% uh, uh, you know, API compatible with DynamoDB. So from an application perspective, if you have an existing application that you have against DynamoDB, you make basically three lines of code change to make it talk to DAX, and DAX pretty much you know, figures it all out. The caching uh, technology itself is based on you know, uh, last recently used. So the more um, you know, uh, when you access a data or an item from the backend DynamoDB, DynamoDB uh, Accelerator automatically caches the data. When you are you know, writing uh, to um, in DAX, it automatically you know, routes it back to the DynamoDB behind. You can have a DAX cluster map to one DynamoDB table, or you can map it to multiple DynamoDB tables. Um, it's uh, up to you. Uh, you would find us uh, as uh, with uh, you know, DynamoDB over the past several years, continue to expand on um, you know, DynamoDB Accelerator as well, where essentially from uh, an offering standpoint, they would be fairly indistinguishable in terms of uh, you know, regional availability, SDK availability, and so forth. Um, 
what uh, Expedia has done is essentially leveraged as a um, you know preview participant when we before we released uh, DAX uh, and GA uh, for their uh, real-time uh, analytics app. So what uh, Brandon is going to uh, talk through is uh, their journey in for their streaming application, how they went through uh, the different requirements and uh, netted out with um, making a choice of DynamoDB and DAX. So with that, I will uh, turn over the floor to Brandon. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Vijay. Hi, everyone. I'm Brandon O'Brien, Principal Software Engineer at Expedia Inc. And I work on streaming data systems. And that means I take systems like Spark and Storm and Akka and use that to build compute clusters to process a lot of data really fast. And the use case I use that for is real-time travel analytics. And you know, with that, uh, I want to talk about how DynamoDB and DAX uh, have fit into that architecture. And more than just talking about DynamoDB and DAX, I want to talk about the evolution of the approaches uh, that we tried in our architecture with different streaming systems uh, that led us to look at DynamoDB and DAX as a solution for something called reference data in streaming systems. And reference data is simply any data that the streaming processor needs to implement the business logic that it doesn't get directly from the data stream. So my hope is that by sharing this information, uh, everyone here will be able to take home uh, a little bit of, of information that they can use for their work. So before I start the presentation, let me just do a quick icebreaker. So raise your hand if you're from the West Coast. Raise your hand if you're from the East Coast. Raise your hand if you're from outside the US. Raise your hand if you think Bitcoin at 10,000 is a bubble. Raise your hand if you want to take bets on the, OK, OK, just, just, just kidding. OK, uh, now uh, seriously, um, so who has, who has built a streaming system before and deployed it to production? OK, uh, who has not built one but is looking at building one now? OK, great. Let's get into it. So first, I want to give some context for what we do at Expedia, what travel analytics look like, so that you have some business context for the problem that, that my team is looking at solving. And then we're going to look at patterns for reference data. And this is the patterns to make that reference data accessible to the streaming processor. And that, that'll be the main part of the presentation. And then we'll end with how we've started to use DynamoDB and DAX to provide that reference data in a way that provides a scalability and performance, and in a way that has lower operational overhead, and that's been uh, a big reducer for headaches on my team. So first off, so for anyone who's not familiar, Expedia is a two-sided marketplace. It's multiple products, multiple brands, and it's a global travel system. So on the shopping side, we have multiple websites, multiple brands, Expedia.com, Hotels.com, HomeAway for vacation rentals, and many others. On the supply side, there's all kinds of supply systems that we wire into, different GDSs for lodging, and uh, on the flights as well. Many, there's a huge network of supply integration. And so for someone who's looking at travel analytics and data, what you actually have is two very massive data streams from the supply side and from the shopper side. To give you an, an idea of the kind of scale that we're operating at, so we have about 500,000 properties for traditional lodging, uh, lodging properties. For vacation rentals at home away, it's about 1.5 million. And then you can snapshot this, but for the purpose of the presentation, really 600 million site visits uh, per month across all e-sites will give you an idea of kind of the scale that the streaming processors that I'll be talking about will be operating at because the main focus for my systems is essentially user behavior analysis. So for the class of travel analytics, uh, a big one is creating a live view of demand patterns. So that's, you have shoppers coming to Expedia and they're doing hotel searches, they're doing flight searches, they're doing these bookings, and all of that data ends up in Kafka as messages. And so you have this massive firehose of, of rich user behavior data and that's where my systems plug into it. 
And a classic use case for that is just looking at demand patterns and giving that to hotel suppliers uh, in an, an anonymized way so that they can see, okay, what dates are popular in my market? And you know, this weekend versus ne next weekend. And providing that information in a real-time way so that the lodging supplier has a real-time view of that so they can make decisions quickly on how do they want to position themselves in the market. Then for shoppers, uh, here's the example below. So we have the, the cross-out price there. Essentially, to compute that price, we want to look at real-time price, prices as they flow this, through the system and then create an aggregate price in real time. And the challenge there is that the prices that go into that aggregate figure are always, are always moving uh, as hotels are changing prices and selling out. So we need a real-time system to compute that and make it available for display on our brand websites like Expedia.com. And then additionally, creating live views of the market for internal business strategy and operations teams. So those are essentially the, um, you know, the class of use cases that we're looking at. Now to, to tie it back to where DynamoDB and DAX will fit in, in, in my work with these travel analytics, the, the key feature that has really exploded the possible space of features we can implement is getting access to reference data. And conceptually, that's, that's a very simple thing. It's say you have a hotel stream and it has keys for the hotels, and you want to look up information about the hotels that's not available on the stream. And that could be something like the star rating for the hotel, so that you could compute a real-time histogram of searches by star rating to use that for whatever business case you want. And while conceptually simple, uh, in reality, uh, in production at scale, you run into all kinds of challenges, like data availability and scalability and mutability of the data set, where these data sets are not static over time. And so if you were to just load, say, a static lookup file into your streaming processor, that will quickly go out of date. And as of right now, for some of the streaming processors I've been working on, I have one that's been running in production for coming up on three years now. And I can tell you that the, the reference data that it needs has constantly mutated over time. And so we need a way to be able to handle that elegantly. Uh, and additionally, typically when you're building a streaming system, you're not just building a single streaming system. You end up building an entire ecosystem of streaming systems, of streaming processors to handle different use cases. And I started using this term called reference domain layer to talk about the platform that provides uh, the data access to the reference data in a way that's reusable. So when you have an ecosystem of streaming processors, that they can all leverage, they can leverage access to that reference data. And that's, that's where DynamoDB and DAX will fit in. So for the reference data itself, this will fit into performance. Wherever I look, at least in the data that I look at, it always follows this power law distribution. Sorry, was that microphone not, not actually on before? We good? OK. Uh, it, always, it always follows this Pareto distribution. And that's exactly what it looks like. In this case, for example, this is hotel searches by city. And so you have the Vegases and you have the, the Parises and Tokyos of the world, and they get orders of magnitude more searches, more action uh, than somewhere in, say, rural Nebraska. And what this lends itself to is a high cacheability. So if you have a very non-uniform access pattern to the data, you can exploit that to keep, keep recently accessed values in some place in memory, which we'll work with DAX later. And reference data sets, common ones, things like travel dates, hotels, flight routes, things like that. And while we have a high cache hit rate, the data sets can often be very high cardinality, very large data sets. And so this sample of data that we see, for example, uh, it actually stands, extends about two to three times out to the right. And so if you were to just cache all of this data, it could become prohibitively expensive uh, to do that. So here's the, here's the grading system that I've started using in looking at access to reference data. And I've, I've convinced myself that when a streaming processor gets to a sufficient amount of complexity, when you're trying to handle very sophisticated use cases, you will have to think about all of these things for access to the reference data. And so you have performance, things like scalability, throughput. You have data management, 
So is the data safe, is it durable? Handling the mutability over time and being able to scale the storage without having to change the architecture. And then things about the wider system. So reusability of that data from multiple systems uh, is very key. And then also operational overhead and simplicity and flexibility. So one thing I, I definitely want to avoid is a very high performance, high scale Rube Goldberg machine. So let me put those over there. And so, so here's the journey of different things that we've actually tried over time before getting to DynamoDB and DAX. And so we'll walk through these and I'll talk about some of the pros and cons that we've had uh, dealing with these. So first off, keeping the streaming data, keeping the reference data in memory in heap. And this is, this is pretty much the fastest approach that, that you can take. Uh, so this is essentially keeping the data uh, directly in a hash map in memory in the streaming processor. And this is, this is really kind of an ideal approach. If you can fit all of your data uh, in memory uh, in your streaming processor in the JVM, uh, that, that works great. But then you run into some problems around uh, durability. So it only exists for the life cycle of the streaming processor. You might run into challenges of updating that over time. Uh, and then obviously that's not very reusable because it only exists in memory in the streaming processor. So it's an, it's an approach that works very well, but just for small amounts of data set that don't mutate over time. So then you th might think, okay, well, let me look at putting it on the streaming processor disk. And I know this, this has been a very popular approach for certain use cases. And so this is essentially uh, creating some kind of uh, key value store like rocks, DB, putting it on the streaming processor disk. And then the streaming processor can access it without having to do network IO. And for, for certain use cases, that works well, but then you, you run into problems where you either have to keep a complete copy of the reference data set uh, on every streaming node, or you'll have to do network traffic. You might be able to avoid that network traffic if your key partitioning strategy for your stream can coincide with the key partitioning strategy for the data, but then that locks you into a single use case, and as soon as you modify the, that partitioning strategy, now you have taken that hit to, to go across the network, and at that point, uh, why complicate the streaming processor? Uh, and that complication of the streaming processor is really complicating the life cycle of the streaming processor. So if you wanted to containerize your Spark nodes, for example, uh, now you have to load all that reference data onto that, that node, say on ECS, for example, or Kubernetes, and you have to load that uh, after that node becomes available, but before it's actually attached to the cluster for uh, taking messages, and now it, it gets very complicated. And, and personally, one approach uh, that I'm interested in taking later is looking at doing serverless streaming processing. And then obviously, an approach like this uh, for accessing reference data won't work in that case. So a direct service call. So this is an interesting approach. So you might think, okay, well, let me just not manage the reference data myself. I'll just go directly to that hotel service that has that data. And you know, presumably, you have maximum durability and scalable storage uh, because you're talking directly to the service that's responsible for managing that. It's, it, you know, it's, it's simple. It's just a service call. Operational overhead is low because someone else is managing it. And reusability is high. It, multiple streaming processors can use it. And it, it may or may not be fast. You may have the availability. It depends on the SLA for that service. Uh, but there, there's another issue, and that's kind of a deal breaker for me, uh, which is if you're adding contention to resources that were designed for the users for your website, that's really, that's really a showstopper. And uh, uh, don't tell anyone, but I actually had to have this conversation with my streaming processors long ago when I first got started. So. Redis, Redis Elastic Cache. So this is an approach uh, that I love, uh, but it does, doesn't quite work. Uh, so this is having a separate Elastic Cache instance outside of your streaming processors. So you have multiple streaming processors. Each streaming processor has multiple nodes. And the idea is then you have some other application that's responsible for writing data into Redis. And then all of your streaming processor nodes can just pick up that data from Redis. And then they, they may or may not 
combine this with that approach as well of, of keeping it in memory with some kind of, of tactical short cache. Uh, and and this, this works reasonably well. Uh, it's extremely fast because the data is all in memory in Redis. The access times are ex extremely fast. Uh, problems come in with uh, durability and availability. Um, so if, uh, if, so obviously Redis is designed as, as just a cache, not an actual uh, data store for re record. So it, this work for me using this and this not working well is, is kind of my fault for going out of, out of really the, the realm of what Redis was designed for. But uh, a couple other things happen which complicate this, and this is at least as of 2.8.x, the defaults for Redis Elastic Cache in AWS, uh, if you overload the cache with data, I, I thought with an LRU approach that the uh, data would actually just drop off, but uh, it actually will uh, just crash Redis. Uh, you will lose your data, and you will not have a good time. Maybe that's fixed as of uh, 3.2. Uh, I haven't tested that yet. Um, and additionally, we did uh, run into a case where uh, Redis, uh, the machine actually became uh, unresponsive. This is with uh, Elastic Cache. And we actually had to uh, kill that node and create a new one. And so maybe if you use something like uh, Netflix's Dynamite to create a uh, Cassandra-like ring of Redis instances, you could avoid those kind of availability problems. Um, so that it's an approach worth, worth exploring. So at this point in the journey, uh, uh, so a, a quote comes to mind, which is essentially, performance doesn't matter uh, if your system isn't running. So uh, when you're building a streaming system, or when I'm building a streaming system, uh, it really got to the point where uh, we, have to hand, we have to make sure the availability is there and that it's processing the data correctly. Get that 100% uh, and then dial back up performance. So I started looking at more traditional databases. Uh, we tried out Cassandra. And so Cassandra meets more of the requirements. Obviously, the performance is there. The data management is there. You have the redundancy uh, across different nodes. You can specify the replication factor so you can actually tune how safe the data is. It's very mutable. You just have whatever, whatever system is managing that reference data can just write the updates into Cassandra. It's available from all streaming processors. And I, I think it's, it, then in terms of operational overhead and then actually simplicity and flexibility, uh, that, that's where it starts to break down. So in my experience, and this is more a comment just about the skill set of my team uh, rather than Cassandra, the operational overhead became prohibitive. Uh, we were a small team. We had one guy who ended up spending about half of his time just keeping the whole thing running. And the biggest piece of that was Cassandra. And so at that point, I realized, OK, it gives us the performance and the availability and the durability. But now we're having to tell our product team that we really have to slow down because we're spending so much time just keeping what we have running, running, and we can't build new features. So I thought, OK, we need something that is easier to run. So I started looking at traditional databases, RDS MySQL. And that's indeed far easier to run, in my experience. It has all the durability and availability. Operational overhead is, is basically zero because it's a managed service. So, so I'm thinking, OK, this, this, this is working a lot better. But for higher scale, high performance streaming systems, the, the access to the data just wasn't quite fast enough. So if we're looking at, you know, depending on the system and how high you scale it, you might have like 50 milliseconds for read time or maybe higher. Um, with the streaming processor, you really need to be at like 10 milliseconds or less, ideally, on average, when you look at the data access time, or else it's just really going to slow down the streaming processor when you're operating at scale. So I thought, OK, great. Let me just combine that with Redis Elastic Cache. And I felt like we were really getting something uh, we were getting, really getting somewhere here where we had that availability and the durability that the traditional SQL database offered. And now, now that we were leveraging that with a single external cache that all of the streaming processors could leverage, now we were really, really getting the availability and performance, so average performance over time. And the, the system economics of that worked out really well where uh, 
you have one node of one streaming processor, it does the heavy lifting of going to the database to pick up the data when it's a cache miss, putting that in the cache, and then any other node in any other streaming processor can just pick it up from Redis and have a one millisecond access time instead of 50 millisecond access times. So that worked out pretty well. The complicating factor was now we were writing all kinds of cache coherency code. So now, now this streaming processor had to check the cache. If it's not there, it has to check the database. Uh, has to pick it up and put it in the cache, and maybe you have some external system that is updating that data in MySQL and, and Redis. Well, does it write to Redis first? Does it write to MySQL first? And can you miss something where then you have a stale, a stale instance of the data somewhere higher up in the cache? And it's, it's, it's a little annoying, but it's, it's not that bad because at a certain point you've, you've, you've tested it, you've written the code, and it works. Uh, the only problem is that if you're, if you're changing that and as you're writing new streaming processors, if you use, uh, say you want to use some new streaming processor, you might have to re-implement that. It's just uh, an opportunity to introduce uh, bugs and data ins inconsistencies into the system. So we had that all working, and we were thinking, okay, this is, uh, this is pretty good. And then at that point, um, I just spoiled it. So we, um, we had that working. Uh, and at that point, I started working with uh, AWS on a DAX preview. And I had looked at DynamoDB before for this use case, but I thought I had done the napkin math on what the provisioned read capacity would be to, um, to actually handle these kinds of use cases. And I thought, OK, that, you know, that might not work for what I'm trying to do here. Uh, and that's, and then if I'm using DynamoDB, it'll be as complex as what I've already implemented with RDS MySQL. So really, I don't really have an, an excuse to try this out. Uh, but when I learned about DAX, uh, it looked uh, very familiar to what I had uh, implemented myself. So it handled all that cache coherency for me uh, in a way where uh, I didn't have to worry about it. So I thought, all right, well, let me try this out. And so, so far, this is working uh, very well. So it gives us that, that performance that we're looking for, super availability of DynamoDB, uh, with the fast access times of DAX. And you can conceptually think about it like uh, Redis Elasticache uh, in front of DynamoDB, but it's managed. And, uh, and, and again, though, that performance, though, is predicated on the non-uniform data access patterns. So, uh, if we had a completely flat distribution, it wouldn't really be cacheable unless we wanted to store everything in a cache, uh, then the performance would not be nearly as good. Uh, but in our instance, uh, we are able to actually observe very high cache hit rates uh, in production. And so this, this is working out quite well. Uh, operational overhead is essentially zero. Uh, in terms of challenges to this approach, well, now I really have to spend time to figure out what, what the right uh, provisioned capacity should be. And if you go above that, you get, you get throttled. And so you have to spend time kind of tweaking what, that, what those knobs should look like. But for me, that's, that's a, a much easier game to play than some of the complexity of the other approaches. Uh, and additionally, say, say, for example, if you're doing cold start on a streaming system, then uh, I've actually gone and just upped the read capacity to be able to uh, hydrate the cache appropriately and then dialed it back down afterwards. Uh, and then when I do that, uh, actually just do that modestly. You don't want to crank up the read uh, provision capacity uh, too high because of something called partitioning uh, dilution, which I'll explain. And then in reality, this is approached with a very tactical in-heap uh, cache, so something like Google Guava for an LRU approach. So then in reality, what happens is you have the data coming in on the stream. Uh, the streaming processor uh, asks maybe a singleton uh, instance of Google Guava. Do you have that? If it doesn't have it, it goes to DAX. If DAX doesn't have it, it goes to DynamoDB. And the system elegantly hydrates the levels of the cache for you. So this is what it looks like. And I'm, I'm happy to say that it's actually a rather simple uh, diagram. Uh, and that's, that's what DAX and Dynamo, DynamoDB have allowed this to be. So we have 
event streams over on the left, they come into Kafka, and then we have our streaming processor picking that up, and then it does whatever processing, sends it downstream to different data syncs. Meanwhile, it's picking up data directly from DAX. DAX may or may not have that data. It may have to go to DynamoDB, but the application doesn't know or care about that because to the application, the client for DAX is exactly like DynamoDB, so it doesn't actually know if it's talking to DynamoDB or DAX. And then the way that we handled the reference, uh, the reference data is we have some kind of reference data change stream. So if you have a hotel, a hotel data set, for example, whatever service is responsible for managing that uh, hotel data, when it has an attribute uh, change for that hotel, it publishes that to Kafka, and we have just a very small application, picks up the key value store, and writes it to DAX, and DAX can function as uh, write through cache. So the key value writer writes to DAX, DAX stores it in memory, uh, and then writes through uh, to DynamoDB to persist it. So for some of the original performance benchmarks that uh, gave me the confidence to move forward with this approach, let me, let me talk about those. So the setup is one, uh, one DAX instance against the DynamoDB table, and it's the smallest instance, which has about 13 gigabytes of storage, default TTL, five minutes, and we're using eventually consistent reads. Uh, one thing to note is that if you're doing consistent reads, if, if you know, for example, that you need to do all consistent reads uh, against the database, uh, you wouldn't want to use DAX because uh, when you use the consistent read, it actually bypasses DAX. The data set has uh, small cardinality, a million, million items, and these are small key value pairs. And the rules of thumb that I've used throughout testing is when you have a DAX cache hit, it's about a millisecond or less. When you have a miss, it's 11 milliseconds. And that's about one millisecond more than what it would take to actually do the read directly against DynamoDB. And so there, there is a little bit of a performance hit for using DAX in that case. But to the degree that you can achieve a high cache hit ratio, that performance will look better over time. And so here, here are the results that I ran. So on a small test, and uh, the test setup, this is a, a Spark cluster of about four nodes hitting a single DAX instance, issuing uh, 3,500 requests per second uh, using batching, so you have about 25 items per request. So I was able to look up 80,000 items per second with a cache hit rate of effectively 80%, and the CPU of DAX is unstressed at 5%. And then here's, here's the kicker. Here's the, here's the thing that, that I think is cool about this, is that with that cache hit ratio, the provisioned read capacity on Dynamo is, is, is tiny. So we have 100 read capacity units, but we were able to achieve uh, 80,000 lookups per second. And to me, that's, that's very cool. And, but that's, you, you achieve that at the steady state running. So if you have to hydrate the cache initially, uh, you, may, you might need more RCU or it might do some throttling. But once you get to that 80%, you can achieve very very high uh, read throughput on low provision capacity in DynamoDB because DAX is storing it in memory. Higher volume test, 15,000 requests per second, returning 300,000 key value pairs per second. And again, these are very small items. Cash hit rate, 99%. At this point, almost everything's in memory. Uh, CPU is stressed at this point, 80%. And RCU is at 500. But still, when you have a cash hit rate, that is high enough, you can achieve uh, insane read throughput uh, on low provision capacity for the table. So for our team, this has really provided uh, a great balance uh, for performance and scalability, uh, availability, durability, everything, uh, in a way that's much lower operational overhead. And so we have, uh, it just takes less time to keep it running and we have a higher guarantee that it's, it's not going to fail. And uh, for me, uh, I like not, uh, I, don't, I don't know about you guys, but if I, ever, if I ever get woken up by the hot phone at 2 a.m., I'm not like, oh boy, party time. I don't, maybe, maybe, maybe you guys are. Um, I want something that just works. Uh, this also works well for in-situ reusability across multiple streaming processors. 
And then provided that you have a sufficiently non-uniform data access pattern, it can be extremely cost effective and performant because it's storing everything in DAX. So for me, uh, access to reference data should be simple. Conceptually, just a key value lookup uh, and uh, a hash join with the data. And I feel like this approach with DynamoDB and DAX helps to keep it simple. All right, so a few tips to share with you. Uh, biggest performance boost uh, on DAX, uh, use batching. I believe the max, uh, max, max back size right now is 25, but I, that gives me about a 10 to 20x speed up. Uh, with the DynamoDB client itself, uh, I have not consistently observed uh, performance improvements using the TCP Keep Alive. One note with the DAX client, it, uh, it uses uh, open TCP uh, sockets, uh, so it's essentially already doing that. Uh, for larger objects, uh, you can save a little bit on bandwidth and deserialization time if you use a projection. So if you have many objects in the table or many attributes uh, in the table, you can just return the subset, which you actually need. Uh, and then partition dilution. Uh, so this, uh, raise your hand if you understand what, what partition dilution is. All right, uh, I'll go ahead and explain that because it's really important if you're running uh, DynamoDB in production. So you have the provisioned uh, throughput capacity, uh, both on the read side and the write side. And say you have, you set it at 100, a read capacity of 100. Uh, that's, that's at the whole table. But what actually happens is it's divided equally among all the partitions. And so if you have 10 partitions in a table of 100 uh, read capacity, uh, that's actually 10 read capacity per partition. And so if you're access to that data is uniform, then you can achieve 100 uh, RCU in aggregate. But say, for example, if you have non-uniform access to that data and you have a hotkey so that all your requests go to the same partition, your table will be bottlenecked at effectively 10 RCU when you had provisioned uh, 100 RCU for the entire table. And so the the area where that can happen is, one is if you have, uh, so if, if you choose a low cardinality key for your table, then you can exacerbate that problem by having hotter keys. Uh, but then also if you scale up your, your RCUs massively, it'll increase the number of partitions in the DynamoDB table. And then if you scale back down, you run the risk of, of getting bottlenecked, uh, not, uh, not based on the RCU of the entire table, but just for an individual hot partition. So for the client itself, uh, so it's thread safe, so you could reuse the client. You could keep a singleton instance uh, in your streaming processor. Uh, the instantiation time is only about 20 milliseconds, so it's not saving you a whole bunch. Uh, in terms of guaranteed message processing and Spark, uh, which is what I'm using this for, uh, with the provision throughput uh, exceeded exception, uh, the way I handle that is I actually pause the streaming processor and do an exponential back off. And so when it gets that throttling exception, a Spark essentially just, just pauses and waits and then keeps trying. And in the meantime, it doesn't update the Kafka offsets. And I have a separate process which then monitors the Kafka lag and will alert me if the streaming processor is falling too far behind. So then what you can run into is just uh, some intermittent throttling, but uh, you run into that, and then the uh, processor is able to continue once it gets past that. Uh, and if that is happening too frequently, uh, then you should probably just provision a little bit more uh, read capacity on the table. And then for Spark, for singleton LRU cache, I'm using Guava, and I just hold it uh, in a singleton static place in the executor JVM uh, to store reference data so again, you have streaming processor coming in, or streaming data coming in. Uh, Spark asks the Google Guava instance, uh, do you have the data? Guava goes to DAX, DAX goes to DynamoDB, and this, this so far is working reasonably well. So with that, that's my story. And uh, I'd like to thank you for listening. I hope that each person was able to get at least some some piece of information from this.
And uh, I'd like to open up for uh, Q&A if anyone has questions. Thank you.